Thanks very much, Nigel. This is, uh, I'm uh, for the, also for the very flattering introduction. It's a special honor for me to, to give a lecture that's dedicated to uh, uh, such a wonderful colleague as uh, um, Mike Nessheim, who made so many fundamental contributions to uh, the biochemistry of hemostasis, characterizing a number of the key genes and proteins that I'm going to talk about today. So um, this is my title. I'm going to talk about the genetics of thrombosis, and I'm going to try to touch a bit on mice and humans. The clotting cascade in our, in our field of hemostasis, uh, I think our link between the basic laboratory and the bench side is one of the, the best examples of this kind of interaction in, in science. If one looks at the clotting cascade, the key uh, genes and proteins involved in regulating hemostasis and thrombosis, nearly all of them were initially discovered by studying patients deficient in that factor. Uh, we now, as we'll talk about, have mice that we can study that are missing uh, deficient in just about every one of these genes and have an enormous uh, uh, capacity for studying uh, the function of these proteins and the regulation of clotting in humans and in mice. There's been an incredible explosion of uh, our understanding of human genetic diseases. And in particular, we've had incredible success studying diseases due to single gene disorders, uh, what's so-called monogenic diseases. Uh, when I was in medical school, uh, right around the, near the beginning of this graph, there was one gene that we knew of which was associated with human disease, and that was hemoglobin. Today, that number is 3,412 uh, and counting. Uh, and uh, it, it, this includes many of the uh, in, inherited bleeding and blood clotting diseases. However, there are also a lot of very important diseases, in fact, many of the more common diseases that we deal with in the clinic, that are so-called complex genetic diseases that involve many genes interacting in complex ways and with other factors other than genes. Thrombosis is somewhere in between. There are some examples of autosomal dominant type of inheritance of uh, specific defects in blood clotting factor genes like antithrombin-3 and protein CNS. Other gene variants like factor V Leiden and prothrombin-2 or 2.0 that are much more common and have a more modest or moderate uh, effect on risk. Overall, one's chance of having a blood clot, the risk of VTE, is highly heritable. Somewhere around 50 to 60 percent of the overall risk can be attributed to genetic factors. And we can account for somewhere in the order of 50 percent. We could debate whether it maybe ought to be, we ought to give this ourselves a lower score than that. These are the big factors that account for much of that, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Factor V Leiden, an elevated VWF, uh, and, and factor VIII, and the prothrombin variant. Well, there's been an explosion in our ability to, to address these kinds of complex diseases also with the identification of common variants in the human genome. Going back again to the uh, early 80s, we had very, very few markers. I'm showing here just one human chromosome as an example, uh, whereas there were three markers, genetic variants, we knew of on human chromosome 4 in 1981. Today, that's over 5 million. We can very easily, routinely, at low cost, test over a million of these variants in an individual. And we are now doing studies of tens or even hundreds of thousands of patients in this way. And the basic idea is to look at inheritance of various parts of the genome, along with a trait, a complex disease, to see if we can identify common variants that contribute to that disease. And here also there's been an explosion. Uh, this is the, the latest compilation uh, at, uh, at the NIH um, in the Genome Project. And the count at the end of 2013 was 1,960 genome-wide association studies that had been published. The number's higher now. In just about every disease one can think of. Well, let me give you an example of the kinds of things we learned from these uh, studies. Type 2 diabetes... Uh, was one of the, the uh, holy grails, if you will, uh, for this kind of approach. The v a very common disease, highly genetic, at least 50% heritable, um, but very difficult to pin down to single, only very few due to single monogenic disorders. These kinds of genome-wide association studies have been done now. This is a, 
a meta-analysis of, of uh, over 100,000 patients, and one finds many genes. Uh, this is the so-called Manhattan plot. This is how these genome-wide association studies are typically displayed. It's got this name because uh, many thought it sort of looked like the skyline of Manhattan, particularly for a disease like diabetes. As of the most recent compilation, there are 59 significant loci here, genes that are contributing variants, mostly co fairly common in the population, that contribute to diabetes risk. But disappointingly, in total, this only accounts for maybe 10% of the heritable risk. So there's still a huge amount that we can't account for, what geneticists often call the dark matter of genetics or the missing heritability. And is this clinically useful? To date, I think the short answer is no. The vast majority of the DNA variants we've found increase your risk of diabetes by, by a relatively small amount, 1.1-fold, 1.2-fold, whereas weight, family history are much more predictive. Uh, and at this point, this kind of testing really has not yet earned a place in our standard approach to treating this disease. Now, with these close to 2,000 GWAS studies that have been done, what have we learned? And to me, I think there are a number of very important lessons to take home, and I've, I've listed some of them here. One of the very important ones, I think, and it's, it's a sobering thing for us to, to keep in mind, is that prior to the GWAS area, era, it was very common for us to pick our favorite variant in a gene, and I'll come back to this point a little bit later, and see whether it was associated with more prevalent in patients with the disease than in controls. And there are probably somewhere in the order of 30 or 40,000 of these sorts of analyses published. One of the things we've learned from GWAS is that most of these are wrong. They're probably statistical errors. People publishing, doing maybe 20 of these, and publishing the one that was significant at the 0.05 level by chance. Take diabetes, for example. There are several thousand of these published, and very few, virtually just a handful, have shown up been confirmed by GWAS studies, which are much more powerful and accurate. The other disappointing thing is that the vast majority of these variants, these common variants we found, have very small effects. They increase the risk by a very small amount. And taken together, as in the case of diabetes, they only account for a relatively small amount of the, of the overall risk, making them not all that useful clinically at this point. There are probably some exceptions. Uh, the, the first uh, success of GWAS was identifying complement factor H variants that contribute to adult onset macular degeneration, and one might argue that this has some uh, utility. It has an effect on risk similar to factor V Leiden. Uh, BCLA, uh, BCL11A variants here affect fetal hemoglobin, uh, and this, may, uh, this is an important uh, uh, factor in the severity of various hemoglobinopathies. Thrombosis, well, we'll debate that uh, through the rest of my talk. The, there's certainly lots of promise from these findings. There's hope that the, the various loci that we've identified in this way will identify new biologic pathways, potentially identify new drug targets, uh, but this is still uh, a promise at this point. So what about thrombosis? Well, here's the most recent uh, uh, summary. This is a meta-analysis of all the available uh, GWAS data for VTE, for uh, venous thromboembolic disease. A total of 7,507 cases. Uh, this was just reported uh, a few months ago in the American Journal of Human Genetics, and this data has also been uh, presented by Jermaine et al. here at this meeting. And this is relatively small for GWASs of other complex diseases like diabetes and hypertension, et cetera. And what do we find? You can see the significant uh, loci identified here. By far and away, the two most significant are factor V. The signal is due to factor V Leiden, which we've known about for a while and was identified initially by other means, not by genome-wide association, and ABO. And what's the effect of ABO due to? I'll have more to say about that in a minute. There are a number of other factors that we already knew to be associated with, um, with the risk of uh, venous thrombosis. By and large, the effects of most of these common variants, keep in mind that GWAS is really only able to, to detect common variants. The effect of most of these common variants has, is relatively small. And even in total, uh, this gives you only a very limited predictive value for thrombosis risk. There are several novel genes here uh, that have been identified by this meta-analysis that we didn't know of before. 
uh, we're no idea yet how they might contribute to thrombosis risk. I think it's interesting to point out that for, for two of these three genes, the common variant, the one that 70, 80 percent of the population has, is actually the risk variant. In other words, the less common variant is protective. Uh, and this is an interesting thing to think about in terms of how bad can it be for us uh, if the more common allele is the one that has uh, the higher risk. And again, it's a very small risk. Well, what about ABO? The ABO effect, we, we think, is mediated primarily or entirely through its effect on von Willebrand's factor levels. As I'm sure uh, all of you in the audience know, von Willebrand's factor levels, like most blood clotting factors, are highly variable in the general population. It can vary over five-fold, which is really remarkable when one thinks about the fact that at the low end of the spectrum, we have the most common inherited bleeding disorder, and at the high end of the spectrum, increased risk for both arterial and venous thrombosis, yet there's this enormous variation in levels in people. We know that the von Willebrand's factor levels are highly heritable. Somewhere around two-thirds of the variation in von Willebrand's factor levels are due to genes. And about a third of this genetic variation is, in fact, ABO. ABO uh, type O individuals have VWF levels that are 25 to 30 percent lower than non-O individuals. This is an incredibly common, very common variant. As all of you know, roughly half of the European population are type O. As a result, this is an ideal a variant to be detected by GWAS, and that's why we get such a strong signal there, even though the effect of blood type on your risk of thrombosis is modest. The rest of the variation is largely, uh, the genes contributing to this are largely unknown, and this has been an interest for us and, and many other groups over the years. It turns out that von Willebrand's factor levels are also highly variable in mice, uh, and I'm not going to talk about uh, this work uh, in detail today, but my lab spent many years using the mouse to try to get at some of the factors that control von Willebrand's uh, levels. In, in mice, you can see as much as a 20-fold difference among different inbred mouse strains. And for many years, we would take mice with very high levels and mice with very low levels and breed them together and in that way track down the responsible genetic variants and I, I think uh, found some very interesting bits of underlying biology that contribute to the control of EWF levels. Well, what about humans? With the advent of, of, uh, of all these amazing genetic tools we have, it's become much more uh, tractable to approach these kinds of problems in humans. Uh, and we decided to look at variation in VWF levels in healthy young people. As many of you know, as individuals age, uh, VWF levels in blood are sort of like a set rate for the endothelial cell, for the vasculature. And as one develops vascular disease, VWF levels go up. And in the older population, it's less heritable than in young individuals. So we collected a group of close to 1,200 healthy University of Michigan college students uh, in SIB ships, varying from two to six individuals, uh, which would allow us to look not only at genome-wide association, but also linkage, as I'll describe in a minute. And they were then all genotyped and plasma VWF levels measured. We also had a second cohort of uh, students in collaboration with Larry Brody and colleagues at the NIH and at Trinity College in Dublin uh, with another over 2,000 individuals, healthy young college students. And in all of these individuals, we measured VWF levels. And just like you see in any normal cohort, they're highly variable, again, spread over roughly a three to five-fold range. Um, and if one looks at concordance of VWF levels between siblings, that's what's shown here on the right, they're highly concordant. And from this, in fact, we can estimate that the heritability of VWF levels is somewhere in the order of uh, 70%. If you look at the orange squares, these are identical twins, and you can see their levels are even more concordant as one would expect. Well, we did a GWAS for VWF levels, and what did we find? A very strong signal at ABO. Well, we would have expected that. ABO, uh, we could confirm that ABO genetically uh, uh, re helps regulate the level of VWF, and this was highly statistically significant. Uh, the only other statistically significant uh, signal we got was at the VWF gene itself, which also makes sense. One can easily imagine genetic variants at the VWF level affecting the gene's expression, and indeed that is the case. Similar observations have been published before us. Uh, the CHARGE consortium looked at a much larger collection of patients, 24,000 in total. And again, what did they see? A huge signal at ABO, 
a p-value of 10 to the minus 300. Now, I'm not a statistician, but I'm pretty sure that's significant. Actually, I'm not even that sure the sun is going to rise tomorrow, but it's probably close to that. Uh, and the next highest at VWF, just as we'd seen, and then several other smaller signals. It's interesting to note that a, a GWAS done by that uh, uh, same group for factor eight levels looks almost superimposable on, uh, on the VWF GWAS. And this, I think, is actually very instructive biologically. This confirms what we, we knew from, our, uh, from, from the field's biochemical studies, that factor eight levels in plasma are largely determined by VWF levels because of the uh, close uh, uh, association between these proteins and the absence of VWF or low VWF factor eight levels go down and high VWF factor eight goes up. And clearly, in humans, it's genetic variation in VWF that's primarily responsible for the, in the general population, genetic variation in factor eight. Well, because we had collected siblings, this allowed us to look at our data in a different way. We could now ask not just what genetic variants were inherited uh, along with high levels or low levels and a whole bunch of unrelated people. But we could also ask if we take siblings who both have high VWF levels, what regions do they share? And if they both have low levels, what do they share? If they're discordant, where are they different? And in this way, what's called linkage, we could look at the data in a different way. We could confirm ABO. Generally, linkage is not as sensitive to the, to the effect of common variants as GWAS, and that's certainly evident here. But to our surprise, we found another entirely new locus here on chromosome two that gave a very strong signal, highly significant signal in this linkage approach, completely missing by GWAS and completely missing in the earlier, a much larger GWAS from the charge consortium. So what could this be? Well, ABO accounted, as in previous studies, for around a quarter or so of the variance in VWF levels. This new locus on chromosome two had almost as big an effect. So what might this be? Well, we're still not sure. Our hypothesis is that this might be uh, a locus where there are many individual rare genetic variants that in aggregate are common. If you can uh, imagine when we do a GWAS study, we're only gonna be able to pick up variants that many unrelated individuals share, fairly common variants. Typically uh, in, in most standard GWASs, you're only really able to sensitively detect variants that are present in 5% or more of alleles, maybe 1% uh, uh, in some cases. It's a combination of how common it is and how big its effect. However, when we look for in families and we can see sharing, we might be able to pick up rare variants in individual families or a gene that has many of these variants uh, together, we might be able to see it by this linkage approach and not by GWAS. Well, the other thing that we could do with this, with our data, with, with an, another kind of analysis, is get a look at mechanism. And I think this is, an, again, a, a testament to the power of our field, how much we understand about the biochemistry and of the underlying uh, uh, genes that contribute to the regulation of thrombosis and hemostasis to be able to understand some of the underlying mechanisms. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, von Willebrand's factor is uh, encoded by a large gene which makes this, this uh, uh, single polypeptide which assembles into large multimers. And this propeptide here is cleaved off during this processing. And it circulates in plasma free from a VWF. Uh, so if VWF is more rapidly cleared, as happens in the case of uh, uh, ABO type O blood type, VWF that has been decorated by the sugar structures encoded by ABO is cleared more rapidly than uh, the nanotypes. The propeptide may not be affected. And if you look at clearance of von Willebrand's factor compared to clearance of the propeptide, uh, I'm sorry, look at steady state levels of VWF compared to steady state levels of the propeptide, that gives you an idea about clearance. So uh, we did a uh, um, linkage study for the VWF propeptide. And what we found here at ABO, a nice signal for VWF, no signal for the propeptide. This is consistent with ABO affecting VWF levels, not propeptide, and again, suggesting that this is operating via a clearance mechanism, uh, which we've already suspected. And we see a similar thing for this chromosome two locus. This peak is, is a, a different peak. There's no peak by linkage for the propeptide to correspond to the peak in VWF. So this suggests 
that this chromosome 2 gene, whatever it is, uh, operates through some sort of mechanism affecting the clearance of Omobrin's factor. So just to summarize what I've told you, as we know and as evident from the VTE GWASs, von Willebrand's factor level is a key determinant of bleeding and thrombotic risk, and obviously a, uh, a key risk for bleeding at the, at the uh, low end of the spectrum. Uh, genetic variation here has a big effect on the uh, severity of von Willebrand's disease in, in patients uh, with that disorder, and again at the high end contributes to thrombosis risk. ABO is a major effect here accounting for somewhere around a quarter of the genetic variation in VWF. Um, and this operates through accelerated clearance. And uh, this chromosome 2 locus, which we've recently identified, also appears to be uh, mediated via a clearance mechanism. Though we certainly can't use any of this clinically today, it raises the possibility that these kinds of analyses may someday be useful in predicting bleeding and thrombotic risk. So here's where we currently stand with our understanding of VWF variation, uh, largely in, in, in determined by genes, ABO being a big component, this chromosome 2 locus a big component, other more minor effects from other genes, and still some that's unknown. Well, what about uh, back to thrombosis? We've talked about ABO. We already knew about factor V Leiden. The rest of these genes contribute relatively small effects. Are there any other methods that we could use to try to account for some of this missing heritability uh, in uh, VTE? Well, another approach is now becoming applicable to studying human genetic diseases because of the explosion of our ability to do uh, genetic sequence, to do direct gene sequencing, whole genome, whole exome sequencing, is to simply sequence large numbers of individuals and carefully comparing the variation we see in genes in patients with the disease to what we see in control populations, if particular genes have many more variants in affected individuals than in controls, this suggests that rare variants at that locus may be contributing uh, uh, to a, a risk for that disease. And this is a, an approach that's being widely applied now to many genetic diseases. I think maybe disappointing to some of us, it's looking like we still need to have pretty large sets of patients to have enough genetic power for this approach to work. Targeted sequencing of a few uh, known or suspected uh, uh, VTE risk genes has identified uh, uh, an increased uh, accumulation of rare variants in individuals with VTE compared to controls. Applying this across the whole genome becomes more complicated uh, statistically. Uh, we're currently in the process of doing this kind of analysis in about 1,000 uh, VTE samples in collaboration with uh, uh, the group at uh, McMaster and uh, in Leiden, uh, and uh, I hope to be able to tell you about uh, uh, our findings there in another year or so. So I'm going to switch to mice, but before I do so, I want to make sure to acknowledge the people who uh, are responsible for the work I've just talked about on uh, von Willebrand's factor and VTE, uh, genetic uh, 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 regulatory factors. Uh, most of this work has been uh, spearheaded by Carl Desch in our lab, a very uh, talented uh, junior faculty member at the University of Michigan, and a number of folks at Michigan and colleagues around the world who have been key in these studies. Well, let's switch to the mouse. Is the mouse useful? Uh, well, mice are fairly close to humans. Uh, if one looks at this selection of other organisms one could study, the mouse sticks out as a reasonable uh, animal model to think of approaching. But it is important to keep in mind that mice are not human. Uh, I've listed here some of the notable differences between mice and humans, and I think it's important not to, to forget this. There's been a lot of controversy, as I'm sure many of you know, and I know I have many colleagues in the audience who've uh, encountered this criticism of their work, that mice are not humans, and they're different. Uh, there was a study published in uh, PNAS uh, uh, two years ago looking at uh, RNA expression data from peripheral blood in a variety of human studies of sepsis and infection, comparing them to, to uh, mice, and they came up with a very uh, provocative conclusion that humans and mice have nothing at all to do with each other. This got a lot of press, 
uh, around the country, around the world. Uh, New York Times headlines, mice just don't make it as models for human disease. Much less attention, and this is usually what happens, came for this article which appeared in January. You'll notice the similarity in title. This is another group of computational biologists who simply went back and reanalyzed the data from this first paper, and they actually concluded quite the opposite, that the changes they were seeing in the mouse were actually quite reminiscent of uh, what was seen in the human subjects. So, what about hemostasis and thrombosis? I think it's fair to say that mouse models greatly mimic human hemostasis and thrombosis. We now have genetically engineered mice for nearly all known thrombosis and hemostasis factor deficiencies. Uh, pretty much all of the genes and proteins I've talked about and will talk about today. And I think it's also fair to say that in our field, the phenotypes of the mouse knockouts are remarkably similar to those in humans. By and large, mice with all the Mendelian thrombotic uh, uh, disorders, mutations in those genes, uh, have thrombosis like in humans. Mice with uh, knockouts of genes associated with Mendelian bleeding disorders bleed. There's actually a remarkable concordance. Uh, and there are some exceptions. There are clearly some places where the mouse is different. And I would argue that some of those exceptions are particularly useful and instructive about the underlying biology and what's really important about it. So I would point out there are some advantages of the mouse as a model system and I've listed some of them here. Uh, this will look familiar, but in particular, I've highlighted the major factors here. Um, mice have much bigger litters than humans. Uh, they also do it all a lot quicker, and particularly for us geneticists, this is an enormous advantage. <clears throat> so far, though this is rapidly changing, the regulatory burden around studying mice is not quite as difficult as it is for studying humans, uh, but there's, they're closely approaching that. So should we study mice? I would argue that genetically uh, engineered mice are a fantastic tool uh, for studying human disease. Uh, the, they offer us incredibly powerful genetics. They teach us things that we could never learn from directly studying humans, but it's always important to keep in mind that mice are not humans and that everything we find in a mouse may not be directly applicable to human. Well, let me tell you about an example of a mouse study that we're doing in an effort to uh, try to get a handle on uh, previously unappreciated genes that modify a thrombotic risk. We observed a number of years ago, we made a mouse with factor V Leiden. Uh, this technology is actually getting easier and easier. And in, today, one can truly, literally, in a matter of a couple of months, change any nucleotide in the mouse genome that one would like to do, uh, introduce any mutation you'd like to do. And it's, the power of this technology is truly astounding. So we engineered a mouse that has the, the mouse equivalent of factor V Leiden, the same equivalent single amino acid substitution, uh, the mice look a lot like humans. Heterozygotes have occasional thrombosis. Homozygotes are more severely affected, but they basically generally do okay. Uh, TFPI, as many of you know, is a regulator uh, of uh, uh, tissue factor and other aspects of the clotting cascade. Um, and mice with TFPI uh, mutations have been engineered by George Bros's lab. TFPI homozygous mice, that's lethal, the heterozygous mice look perfectly normal. Well, we observed this very surprising and interesting synthetic lethal interaction between these two genes. When we combined these two together in the same mouse, this was almost uniformly lethal right around the time of birth from massive uh, thrombosis. And so if we set up a, a mating in a mouse like this, a mouse who's homozygous for Leiden, cross to a mouse who has one copy of Leiden and is heterozygous for TFPI knockout, Mendel would tell us that a quarter of these mice should have this synthetic lethal genotype, and in fact, we observe very few uh, mice with this genotype because they all die again right around birth. So we use this as a basis for what a geneticist would call a sensitized suppressor screen in an effort to identify genes that might modify the effect of factor V Leiden and potentially other uh, uh, thrombosis uh, risk factors. 
So here's, this is a, this I would argue is an experiment that we cannot readily do in humans. Uh, one can administer uh, to mice the mutagen ENU, ethyl nitrosyurea, which induces large numbers of mutations in the spermatogonia in a male mouse. So this male mouse who's now been treated, all of the sperm he's producing carry many mutations. Each, each sperm has on the order of 30 to 50 genes that have been inactivated by this ENU. And we've illustrated those here as either these black or red stars. We cross this to a heterozygous, uh, doubly heterozygous female mouse, and we're going to get offspring. We're going to expect most of the mice with a synthetic lethal genotype, the Leiden homozygote TFPI heterozygotes, to die, except for that rare mouse that gets a critical mutation that rescues them or suppresses the lethal thrombosis. And these are the mutations we're interested in. Uh, and we've now done this. Uh, uh, this was a fairly heroic work of uh, Randy Westrick, who was a grad student and postdoc at the time and is now an assistant professor at Oakland University in, uh, uh, in Michigan. Um, Randy went through over 7,000 mice and found about 100 mice that had survived with this lethal phenotype. We then did what geneticists do, or used to do in ancient times, say three or four years ago before uh, the advent of uh, some of the modern technology I'm going to tell you about. Uh, in order to track down this mutation, we would have to cross the mutated mouse to another strain so that we had genetic differences that we could now use to map and track down where the responsible mutation might lie. Well, here's what we found. We've managed to track down the mutation in a handful of these mice, so it's been much more difficult than we expected. And even where we found it, there's still questions remaining. So in one of the lines, Randy found a missense mutation in a component of the actin cytoskeleton. It's part of the complex where actin uh, uh, branches. Uh, this single amino acid substitution in a highly conserved residue strongly segregated with rescue, with suppressing this lethal thrombosis. However, we did what we can do in the mouse. We made another mouse with another mutation in this same gene, and this did not rescue. So we're now left with the, with the puzzling question, is there something about, unique about this mutation that's not replicated by the other mutation? Or could there be another mutation in another gene close to this? that's just being inherited along with it, and this is a problem we're trying to sort out. In the case of line six, we tracked the gene down to an interval on chromosome three with a very likely candidate, tissue factor. Well, this made a lot of sense. Tissue factor is inhibited by TFPI, and if you have the lever of TFPI, it makes a lot of sense that having the level of tissue factor might affect it as well. And indeed, when we cross tissue factor knockout mice, to, the, to these uh, Leiden uh, mice, this rescues. So tissue factor, haploinsufficiency sufficiency mutation in tissue factor does rescue. However, we found no mutations in the tissue factor gene itself, suggesting that it's probably a regulatory mutation somewhere outside the gene. And all of this highlights the difficulty of pinning down these mutations, not just in humans, uh, not just in mice, but also in humans, by these purely genetic approaches. And I think it also highlights the importance of the tissue factor TFPI axis uh, and its exact balance for overall uh, thrombotic risk. Now, this is, was another instructive mutation we encountered. In sequencing through a number of our mice, we found this eight base pair deletion in the NBL2 gene. Um, this was quite a surprise, and we got quite excited. NBL2, as many of you may know, uh, uh, is the gene responsible for gray platelet syndrome. And this sort of made sense. So we, we we're going to a, take a platelet bleeding type disorder, and that's going to rescue our thrombotic risk. Uh, indeed, if we made mice homozygous for this mutation, they recapitulated the uh, phenotype of gray platelet syndrome, similar to other published studies in humans and in mice. But here came the surprise. When we traced this mutation uh, back through the pedigree, we were surprised to find that this, e that this mutation was not induced by ENU at all. Here's the parent carrying the ENU-induced mutations. This was in the other parent. And in fact, we could trace this mutation back to a 129 mouse that we had obtained from Jackson Labs. I think this is a very important cautionary tale for anyone who does mouse research and actually anyone who does human research. 
Every individual mouse or human has on average 60 to 100 new mutations that were not present in either parent. It's part of the casualties of cells dividing and creating uh, a, uh, a new embryo. Uh, and whenever we're looking at an individual, you have to keep in mind that some of the genetic changes they have uh, may not have been inherited from mom or dad, but may be a new mutation. Uh, we're actually working with Jacks to pin down this mutation. It doesn't look like it was in their main colony. Probably any of the rest of you who've ordered 129 uh, mice from Jacks, you're probably not uh, segregating this NBL2 mutation. But if it's critical for your research, you might want to check. So, traditional positional cloning for these mouse mutants has been difficult. And one of the big problems we've realized over uh, the years is this fact of mouse strains. In order to track down the gene, we have to introduce another mouse strain. And mice, like humans, there's, between the strains, there's a lot of genetic diversity. And we introduce millions of differences between the mice that have small, subtle effects on thrombosis balance and make it very difficult to track the gene down at the end. Well, as I alluded to earlier, everything has changed in the modern era. This is dramatically different because of the incredible power of next-gen sequencing and uh, genome editing, two technologies that I would argue are the most transformative uh, advances in uh, uh, biologic, uh, biomedical research, certainly in my uh, career, uh, that are, are transforming the way we do science. Uh, it really has changed the way we, we, we can approach this now. So in our current studies, we don't introduce another strain at all. We do our work exclusively in the black six strain without introducing the confounding effect of other mouse strains. We're able to do this because we can now simply sequence all the mice we find and look directly. And let me explain how this works. We use uh, a, a mutation burden test, somewhat like the example I talked about that we're starting to apply in humans. What we can do now is take a whole bunch of these rescued mice do whole exome or whole genome sequencing, look at every ENU-induced mutation they've acquired. And if we look at where they accumulate, are there any genes that are accumulating more mutations than you expect by chance? Uh, you're peppering all these random mutations throughout the genome. If there are places where you accumulate lots of mutations, that will suggest that that is a critical gene. Many different events have caused the same uh, phenotype. So we've now analyzed, uh, um, we just completed whole exome sequence analysis of 114 of these suppressor mice, mice who survive with this lethal phenotype. We see the expected type of the VNU mutations, um, and uh, uh, it fits with what we'd expect from ENU. And when we do a statistical analysis, here are all the genes and the number of variants they have, and an important thing we have to do is correct for gene size, because that turns out to be an important factor. This one gene here was a real outlier. It's a gene called Titan. It is an enormous gene, the biggest gene in the human genome by a lot. There were 15 mutations in Titan. No other gene had more than three. However, when we, I'm sorry, no other gene had more than five, but when we corrected for the size of the gene, this was no longer significant. Uh, Titan's actually down here somewhere. However, there were a number of genes that uh, using the, the appropriate type of statistical control were, had mutations that were much more common in number than we would expect by chance. And we're excited about the possibility that a significant subset of these may represent authentic modifiers of hemostatic balance and thrombosis risk in the mouse and potentially generalizable to humans. So where do we stand today? We've got lots of clues about genes that, uh, that matter in humans for uh, contributing to thrombosis risk, though there are clearly uh, uh, much more to find. We can still account for only a small part of the heritability of thrombosis risk. Uh, we found a number of interesting candidates in the mouse that may or may not be relevant to humans, but even if they're not, I would argue they may point us to very interesting biology that will help us learn more about hemostatic balance and indirectly contribute to our dissection of human risk and potentially identify uh, a great new targets uh, to approach for therapeutics. Well, where do we stand in humans? Where are we at this point in translating all of this explosion in knowledge about the genetics of thrombosis to humans? And here I want to be somewhat cautionary. There are clearly 
well-established risk factors uh, for thrombosis in humans. Uh, uh, I should point out that all of these were uh, identified by conventional biochemical uh, approaches uh, well before the advent of GWAS. And several of these uh, are more penetrant, meaning that the majority of the patients who inherit the particular variant will express uh, 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 have a thrombo thrombosis, but actually none of these are completely penetrant. You can find antithrombin-3 families, individuals with a mutation who never have a thrombosis, all the way up to the much more common factor V Leiden and prothrombin-20210, uh, where most of the individuals with the variants never have a thrombosis. So we know about all of these, but is testing useful? I should also point out there are a number of uh, tests that are done which are clearly of no significance for thrombosis. I've been, uh, it's been said that factor V Leiden is actually the most common genetic test ordered in the United States today. Uh, is it useful? I, I mentioned these two down here because I actually see patients with these incredibly common variants present in actually the majority of the general population referred to my clinic because they're terrified that they're about to drop dead from a thrombosis. This is a great example of single gene associations that are proven to be wrong by GWAS. Neither one of these variants has ever shown up in a GWAS, particularly not for VTE. And we can conclude with near certainty that these variants are not risk factors for thrombosis. Even though they are available through some testing labs, they should never be ordered. What about the others? I would argue that at this point, there really is no clear clinical indications for doing uh, thrombophilia testing. In fact, the re recommendations now from ASH, from several other uh, um, advisory groups, is not to routinely perform uh, thrombophilia testing. I'm sure this is going to change. Uh, I'm sure there will eventually be indications where genetic testing does make sense. And to me, the critical test is, does it change your management? Are we going to do something different as a result of this test? Today, I think the answer to that is no. I think that will change when we finally have evidence of settings where testing changes our management with a positive benefit for the patient. It's a very, uh, I think, provocative paper uh, from Coppins et al. and JTH a number of years ago that showed that genetic testing actually didn't in, uh, improve your chance of having a VTE because of modifications we made to therapy. It actually increased your chance of having a VTE. Patients who were tested actually were more likely to suffer a VTE down the road than equally matched patients who were not tested. And I'll end with a quote that I love from uh, um, uh, Fritz Rosendahl that I think sums up the issue very well. Uh, Fritz uh, uh, says that uh, thrombophilia testing is mainly of psychotherapeutic value. The big question is, who is it for, the patient or the doctor? Uh, so what's going to happen in the future? I think the only thing we can conclude with certainty is that it's going to be different. Uh, I suspect we're in the not too distant future. Newborn screening is going to be performed by full geno genome sequencing so that we're going to have uh, Gen whole genome data on all our patients linked to medical records and the potential for new discoveries is almost unimaginable. Uh, the potential of genome editing to impact the treatment of human diseases I think is enormous, though this is still many years away from the clinic. New advances in, in uh, computational biology will undoubtedly improve our ability to use all of this information to eventually allow us to develop genotype-specific recommendations for therapy and prophylaxis to guide our therapy in a true precision medicine uh, sort of way. But again, I think this is way off and it's going to require a lot more hardcore, high quality, basic research before we're going to be ready for that step. Well, with that, I'll stop. I thank all of you for the, your attention and the ISTH for the honor of giving this plenary lecture. And I'll just end uh, with the uh, people who uh, did the work in the last part of this uh, talk in the mouse, Randy Westrick initially and Kurt Tomberg, who's now continuing this work, and uh, my overall lab, to whom I owe the great privilege of getting to talk about all the work they've done. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>